So whose is this? So this is your your jar of... I did last night. After. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so she left last night at 10 o'clock and went home and painted. That's extraordinary. You know, if, she, if we didn't have these homework assignments, you would have gone to bed. But to stay up at night to try to do that, and I have some students that are that committed. They will actually stay up all night. Mm -hmm. And that's what this is. It's just a commitment. It's just a commitment. But you got it done. Like she got it done. And I mean, that in itself is extraordinary. The reason why I give you homework assignments is because I want you to paint at home. Otherwise you won't. How many, how many hours, how many months did you spend not painting? Because you weren't in class. How many months? Yeah. Not true. 48. 48 months. Because, because you were going to go home and paint on your own. That's what happens. Yeah, not inspired, you know. I think yours like, oh, I'm going to try to do it on my own. I mean, you know, it doesn't even matter if you learn anything from me, just coming in every week. I have people that go coaching calls. The only reason why they call me Saturday morning and pay me money to talk to me Saturday morning is because I'm like their teacher. And they, they like that routine that every Saturday morning, whatever they're doing through the week has to be done. And so they're in their studio. And what happens when you're in your studio? Your genius shows up. It doesn't show up anywhere else. You have to be behind your canvas and pushing paint. Ideas are not good enough. You have to actually apply them. I'm sure there's great pieces of music floating in, in people's heads that never get written down. And when they're dead, they're gone. You have to be doing it in order, it, in order for it to be real. This is awesome. It's a beginning. And the thing is, it's just the beginning. Are you more inspired by it? Yeah. I mean, it's beautiful. It's like, first thing, these are your mom's. Yeah. And then yeah. that Caesar is really, you know, like a 50 years old. Oh, these are like those, those, those little snip scissors. Yeah. I mean, you know, your mom's no longer alive, is she? So this is like family heirloom. All that stuff starts to disappear. It's just a stupid jar of bobbins. You know, it's like, oh my God. It's like you could put all kinds of significance in it. I mean, if she just showed it to me, it's one thing. But all of a sudden when she says, oh, these are all for my mom. And then I think about this little Japanese lady, you know, collecting this stuff in a jar. I mean, you know, it's like there's just all kinds of story there. And I'm like, last night I go, why wouldn't you want to paint this? This is great. Um, beautiful effect. Now the thing, what's really awesome here is that the, the overall painting is kind of in a, in, a, in a unified tone, all grays and blacks. And then the only bits of color you have are all these uh, wonderful col uh, colored spools. All of those spools in there create interest. So you automatically have a center focal point. Now the thing is, the center focal point should be in effect. Color is an effect. So by putting lots of color in a spot, you can create an effect by having all, everything else in shadow. So you're creating an effect. Plus, in order for this to show well, you're going to have the effect of transparent glass and the light hitting that. How well you put the light on top of the glass dictates how well the painting will be produced. Um, how you deal with the rest of it. The only thing missing in this painting to turn it into a masterpiece worthy of a museum is more time. Everything's there. Now, why wouldn't you want to take this to the next level? What were you thinking? I, just, I was inspired by the, the cuff of the shirt somehow. <laughs> <laughs> and so I just kind of watered it up and set it up and started painting last night. Yeah. Now, Judy had mentioned something that looks like a Cezanne. Now, would it be that far-fetched that Cezanne would actually paint a pile of shirts? instead of a pile of apples? And would he like, what, how, whatever style he would do with them would dictate a Cezanne. I mean, we look at Van Gogh, and what did Van Gogh really paint? Few paintings that we really idolize, like the sunflowers or Starry Starry Night. And then you sit there and you go, sunflowers, what a boring subject matter. 
I mean, I'm sure it was everywhere, but it was his take on sunflowers that has us looking at sunflowers from that moment on differently. He showed us how to look at sunflowers. That's extraordinary. Cezanne showed us how to look at apples and how to look at countrysides a different way. The subject matter wasn't extraordinary. It was as dumb as doing sewing composition. But he applied himself and said, you know what, I'm going to change the world. You know, Van Gogh looked at the stars and said, they move. They do. They do. If you stand long enough and stare at the, the stars, they feel like they move. There's energy in them. How do you paint that? I don't know. A lot of people would say starry, starry night is stupid. But it's extraordinary because you think, wow, what if the stars were like that? Even if it's not true, what if? And what was he thinking? You know, I think about that. How did he, what was he thinking? You know? This is awesome. Who would ever think just putting a cuff down, beautiful, using that as an, an object for eye movements, the idea of the button we all relate to, the, the composition, we're close. I'm usually not a big fan of taking something and making it bigger, but, Somehow, I think in this case, we're not mistaken. You know, there is a, a, a reality to how big a cuff and how big a button will be. Um, so I think you can take that subject matter and blow it out of, the, out of the water. I think when you go into faces, it's odd. I think when you go into like fruit, it's odd because an orange looks like a grapefruit. You know, faces up close look really dumb if they're painted too big. Uh, unless they're on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, then... They're irritating. Irritating when you see a face out of proportion. Kind, kind of psychological... It is. You nailed it. Point. Yeah, it's, it's really yeah. irritating. If it's up on an altar or up on a ceiling, you can go big because you yeah. can't get close to it. Right. But if it's like a sergeant painting where you can walk up to it, it is really odd. And so you would see really great portrait paintings never being bigger than life size. But a shirt, we're more interested in the design. Beautiful eye magnets, I'm disappointed on these lines leading out of the canvas. I'd love to see those lines coming into the canvas. I'd love to see more contrast. And if I say, where's your central focal point? The red button. Okay. Now, a red button is what? It's a thing. We don't paint things. <laughs> <laughs> So it should be the light on the red. There should be a little speck of color on that button that's more red than anything else. Beautiful, orangey, gorgeous red. Oh, with the light right next to the table there. Mwah! And then everything else kind of going back. And then we can participate. Is it needle? Yeah, it's a little needle sticking in. Look at the shadow. It looks so real. Yeah, but you see what, what she's interested in, what makes it, it's not the needle that's interesting, it's a little shadow that you have falling off the needle. That's an effect. When we see effects done well, we're, we're amazed. When it's just things, we're not. In fact, in this painting here, when we looked at it earlier, she's got a needle too. But it's not doing anything, it's just there. There's no cast shadow. Had she had a little cast shadow of the needle, you would have said, oh, that's cool. We like something to happen. And when things happen, it's because light has come into the painting. Very good. Yes. Go home and finish it. <laughs> Whose is this? This one. So what were you thinking? I was willing to invest in this. I think you can tell. So this is a very long painting. I was trying to challenge myself, of course, because of all of the ovals, all of the ellipses, putting things in different directions and places and whatever. I stumbled because the bobbins are stainless steel, which is a dark gray, but I couldn't separate it well from the shadow. With I used reflecting colors of items mm -hmm. around it to reflect but I still feel like I didn't do the bobbins correctly. Okay. Or well. well, don't don't get into what all that. But again, okay. the shadows and light and focal. Okay. So where's your focal point? The yellow, the yellow. Bobbin. Okay. Would you all of you guess that that was the case? Yeah. No. Yeah. No. no. I, I see. <laughs> yeah. So how would we do that? Do what? 
How would we actually create that as being a central focal point? I added as much white as I could and piled it on. It didn't, but it didn't work. No, it just had yeah. a dark behind it. Yeah. Isn't it like perfect? It's like perfect, because perfect, it's so perfect. perfect. Yeah. What do we marvel over? It's so perfect. That's your thing, That's yes. But by the way, I, I see the yellow, um, it's, a, it's a real focal. Yeah. Central focal point to me. Yeah. Yeah, it is, but the problem is, is that it has the same emphasis, yes. the same light, the same all throughout the whole painting. So I think, I think this is a really great start. But yes. Because it's threads and they all had the same sheen. Okay. You know, that kind of, the things were so similar that it was difficult to make one thing pop. Okay. You get your, so I'm, how do you determine the photo? But I'm painting. But I'm painting what I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. That is what I saw. Okay, so these are really great questions. So what was your question? Well, when you paint something like this, which is a, a really interesting composition, I really want to keep studying it, but it is confusing because I don't know where to rest my eye. So how do you determine where your focal point? Okay, so you see what your colleagues are saying about your work? Is that's confusing and they don't want to rest their eye? When yes. I, when I uh, close my eyes and sort of blink at it, I feel like I look at a lot of the top of the stuff and the top of the bend. It, my eyes seem to go up there. So you're really busy with all this busy stuff. Okay, so let me answer your question. Let me answer your question. Okay. So how do you determine a focal point when you're dealing with so much busyness? You choose it. You choose it above all. You make the choice. You don't decide it. Deciding, you see a lot of artists do. They'll put paint on and they'll go, well, I'll decide to put it there. No, I'll decide to do it there. That's what deciding. Sometimes color. Uh, color can do it. Right, the color was confusing. The color, but the thing is, Don put a, a, a red button well, that and said. the focal point as far as I was concerned. Well, yeah, but the thing is, we, that's a thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is a thing, okay? So we don't paint things in this class, we paint effects. She's got beautiful things in her painting. We don't take that away, she drew it beautifully. So how do you find a central focal point? First, you start with the idea that you're in control. <laughs> you choose it. When I ask you what's your central focal point, you should have mulled that over to the point that you jump up and go, it's there, obviously. Yeah, it should be obvious. Yeah. But darn it, I mean, that is a beautiful work piece. It um, is beautiful. And, and, I, and I don't want her to, to ruin it. So. She won't. She won't. <laughs> Judy never ruins anything. No, she doesn't ruin anything. Yet. No. <laughs> okay, so you choose, yeah. Um, it seems to me that everything is in the exact same focus. Yes. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it shouldn't be, because if you look at that one point, you've said this a million times, everything around it is yes. not quite so focused as the focal Well, point. she would glaze them. The no, 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 don't <laughs> use the word glazing. That's right. There's a reason why we do glazing, and it has nothing to do, we can, but that's not the point. Now, what Don said is true. Once you choose the focal point, and I tell you, look at that bottle. Once you look at that bottle, you stop looking at me. And I say, look at that bottle over there. And when you look at it, I'll say, look at the cap. When you're looking at the cap, don't move your eyes and tell me what happens to the rest of the bottle. It blurs. All you can do is either look at the cap or you can look at the bottle. But you can't look at the cap and the bottle at the same time. Our depth of field on our eyes are so small that you can't look at two people's eyeballs at the same time. You know, have you ever looked at somebody that has a lazy eye? And your eye goes, which one do I look at? Right? I mean, it's really apparent. You're like going, oh my God, which one do I look at? I don't want to look at the wrong one because they think I'm staring at his eye. You know? They're used to it too. They're looking at your eyes wondering, I wonder if they're getting it right or not. You know? Don't you think that? All of us think that, right? But the thing is, once you look at that, you can't look at the other eye, you can't look at their ear, and you can't look at their background. So if Judy says, that's her center of focal point, that's the only thing that you can see. You cannot see all the stuff in the bin. It's there, but you can't make it out. But you, we don't want her to distort everything. Well, the thing is, it has to either go into shadow. Right, there you go. It has, 
it can glaze, but the problem is is that when you're looking at two eyeballs, one eyeball's in focus, the other one's not. So as things get further away from the viewer's eye, they diminish in focus. So what you see out of here is out of focus. And then I look in front here, this is in focus and you're out of focus. And I look at you and then you're out of focus, you're out of focus. The brain adjusts itself. Now when Judy goes, look at this, here I want you to look. Everything else has to go away. And it goes away with value, it goes away with temperature, it goes away with edges. Your edges have to be soft and as they go further away, they still have to be there, but they have to diminish in crispness. Because the way that we see things, when it's all crisp like a camera, it looks photographic. We don't think that way. The brain doesn't work that way. The brain is constantly choosing what to look at and having a decision, even when you know you're not thinking that the brain's working, it's thinking. And you know this when you look at somebody with a bad eye. Because while you're looking at this person supposedly engaging in a conversation, your brain's going, what do I look at? What do I look like? But you know, your brain's sitting there and you know how it feels. But your brain's doing that all the time. You know, it's focusing on something. When it's not, you're straining to look at it because your brain wants to know what it is. But our brains are also... What, what? What would you suggest she do? I mean, this is really a good lesson, and I think this is something that you've been trying to bring home mm -hmm. as long as I've been here. And it's what I've been bringing home I know, every week. But we're still, we're yep. still painting and paintings and um, uh, you know, wanting to make everything really perfect uh, as far as you know the objects that we have in front of us. Because after all, she she really went to a lot of work to put that together. Mm -hmm. Now this is, this is really easy, this is, you know, every once in a while we end up with the right painting at the right time, you know. It's, as a teacher, it's hard to have a circumstance like a perfect storm. We love what she did. Yeah. Right. What she did was perfect. And as far as what Judy has done in the past, it is consistently perfect. You have a question? I just talked to Emilia and we just were agree that this is just uh, Judy's style. It's, it's just mm -hmm. her and uh, she has recognizable style. Well, there is and nothing wrong with that. I don't think that you have to spoil her style with some kind of... I'm not. So, the last thing I want to do is take away... Okay, so what I'm telling you is this. Throughout history, there are a lot of artists, okay? Throughout history, you have realists, you have portrait artists, you have trompe l'oeil artists. You have artists that paint things really dynamically, and you have artists that render things very well. The consensus through history, namely, name me right now one trompe l'oeil artist that comes to mind. Mm -hmm. Trompe l'oeil. One artist that oh, painted everything what, perfectly. Like, like photograph, where you could pick up the money off the... Name me one artist that did that. Oh, it's Vermeer. Vermeer. Realistic painters. Yeah. Yeah, but name me one. Even the old masters. No, they didn't. Name me one great portrait artist. Portrait? Yeah. Sergeant. Rembrandt. Okay. Okay. What made their paintings extraordinary? What made Vermeer's paintings extraordinary? Why do we remember Vermeer? The lighting. The lighting. Yeah. <laughs> it didn't matter. All the stuff they had in the painting doesn't matter. Well, it's, I was trying to darken the rest of it, and I thought... Well, darkening it is fine, but the thing is you also ha you need... This needs to be darker. This needs to be lighter. Right. You need warm. You need cool. You need temperature changes. You need edges sharp going into transitions of blur. Brush strokes, edges are really important. They're as important as anything else. Some people will say value is more important. Their value is not more important. Everything's important. Value is important. Color is important. Temperature is important. Edges are important. This can be extraordinary. It's, it's really good right now. 
it can be extraordinary with an effect in here that takes it from ordinary to extraordinary. <laughs>